The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and the media. We'll explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Errol Lewis, the host of New York One Inside City Hall. Now you're inside CUNY TV. How about that? Good to see you, Dr. Brown. Thanks for having me on. Okay, now, one of the things that we try to do is to help people understand what our guests have gone through in getting to where they are. You were in print journalism, Daily News, City Sun. Now you're in television journalism. How did you make that transition, and why did you make that transition? Oh, sure. Well, to answer the second question first, there are a lot of people who go from print to television. You almost never see anybody going in the other direction. <laughs> and the reason, frankly, is that television pays a lot more. And so, print media is going down. Well, that's true. Um, and, although I have to say all media are in trouble right now because mm -hmm. there's a lot of turmoil in the, in the business. Mm -hmm. People are able to get information from lots of different sources, mm -hmm. and they can get it for free. And trying to figure out the business model is what a lot of people are, are really uh, obsessed with right now. But just to tell my story a little bit, I started out as a print journalist. And I'm old enough uh, that when I was in college on the school newspaper, we were using manual typewriters. Where were you in college? This is at Harvard. Uh -huh. in, uh, I was in the class of 1984. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were using manual typewriters. We were <laughs> laying things out. I mean, cut and paste was not uh -huh. uh, an expression. It was how you would put together the story, the rough draft. And uh, all of the technology changed right after that. But I, I wanted to be a print journalist. I wanted to write for a newspaper. I thought I might want to own a newspaper at some point. And my first job out of college was um, I wrote the cover story for the first edition of the Old City Sun, now defunct, uh, uh, an ethnic newspaper, black newspaper, based in downtown Brooklyn. And we covered as much of the city as we could. We thought we were competing with the Amsterdam News. We we try and beat them on different stories. We try and beat the New York Times on different stories and manage to do so. What was your first story? Uh, it was called Death of a Generation, mm -hmm. and it was about young black men. So this is 1984, and the statistics were, were very troubling around addiction, incarceration, mm -hmm. homelessness. And uh, this was around the time that I think it was first coming to the attention, at least in, of, of New Yorkers, that the profile of a homeless man was not a middle-aged you know, hobo from the, the 1930s, that it was a young black or Latino male who had family living in the city. And could have been a veteran. And could have been a veteran, right. Well, exactly. So this, is, this was a whole new thing that was going on. Young men in their 20s and 30s who were getting caught up. The, the, uh, the AIDS um, epidemic mm -hmm. was just n really getting a name and getting some publicity for the first time around this time. And so there were a lot of different social problems that were going on all at the same time. And I did my best to sort of uh, gather it all together because the publisher of the City Sun, the late Andrew Cooper, this was what he wanted to do. He wanted it to be a crusading newspaper. He wanted it to talk about big issues that mattered, that were going to be more than just a one-day story. And that was what I wanted to do, too. So um, that, that's where I got started. And from there, you know, you just kind of knock around. There's always a lot of work. I mean, I left the City Sun with a lot of other people most of whom went on to great success, I have to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, former Metro editor of the New York Times was a guy named Joe Sexton, who I met uh -huh. at the City Sun. Mm -hmm. um, there were uh, another fellow named um, Van, who went to um, uh, the Hartford Current. There were, there were my current managing editor at New York One, Dan Jacobson, was my managing editor at the City Sun. And of course, Utrecht Lead went on to a career in radio journalism. So a lot of people went on from there to a lot of different places. Uh, I stayed with print for as long as it seemed sensible. Um, did a lot of writing for Essence, for Black Enterprise, for Smithsonian Magazine. Did a lot of freelancing with um, City Limits Magazine, an investigative journal. Um, and um, over time, I began to do more radio, more television, and for a while had really two full-time jobs, writing for the Daily News, my column, and serving on the editorial board, and also doing the morning show on WWRL Radio. And, uh, and then at night, I'd end up doing a lot of commentary on CNN. So it was, I expected that to last maybe four or five months. It ended up lasting two and a half years. And um, eventually, it made sense to just pick uh, one platform. It ended up being television and really just kind of stick with that. 
Now, Andy Cooper's idea for the City Sun, he had the tagline, Speaking Truth to Power. Yes. And in a sense, that's what you try to do. I know that Andy and the City Sun did stories on certain people in the black community that were not widely, easily received because they were critical of African Americans. How did that influence your career in terms of how you approach controversial topics? Well, it was it was a it was a perfect match, really. I mean, and and it's not it's not just speaking truth to, to power, Dr. Brown. I mean, even when it comes to um, uh, criticizing plays, mm -hmm. and I don't even mean criticizing meaning something negative, but just mm -hmm. reviewing a play, reviewing a book. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time the City Sun began publication in the mid-80s, there was one of the problems that was going on was that it was always happy talk if you looked at the black newspaper, the mm -hmm. black magazines. They wouldn't talk about things like addiction in a real gritty, serious way. They didn't want to ruffle too many feathers mm -hmm. politically. They didn't want to ruffle too many feathers artistically. Some of that impulse was understandable. If you've got somebody who's a black playwright, mm -hmm. you know the kind of struggles they're going through just to get their stuff on stage. So you don't necessarily want to want to pan it. On the other hand, if it's a bad play, mm -hmm. you owe it to your audience to tell people this play could be improved. This play is not so good. It's not very insightful. And so the City Sun really tried to just do a better job of, of, uh, of black journalism, to do a better job that included investigations, including of black officials. That was considered very controversial. Um, to do real hard-hitting analysis of even the cultural output. That, too, was considered uh, somewhat controversial. Armin White was uh, the, the, the film critic, and, and, you know, he would get a lot of pushback. But Andy, to his credit, he told us to go out there, tell the story the way it needs to be told, uh, refer anybody who had a complaint, refer them to him. <laughs> he would fight those battles for us. And um, it, it's the only way to do the, it's only the only way to do a good job. Well, some people felt in the black establishment that he was sort of being unfair, because the he was picking up things and the white press would pick it up and then beat up on the black officials even more. Uh, how did he counter that? If he did, well, I heard more than one loud conversation uh, coming his side of it out of the office, where somebody would call up about something, for instance, that I had written, mm -hmm. and he would just scream at them. You know, yeah, and he and the thing is, the thing is, well, you know, his history. He'd known all of them since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. You know, he he knew these guys. He's known Al. He knew Al Sharpton since Sharpton was a teenager. He knew all of those guys up in Harlem. Um, and so he, you know, he he could talk to them in a way that I couldn't. You yeah, know, well, I mean, obviously. I'm 22 years old, just out of college. I didn't know any of these guys. Um, but he would tell them, look, I know you. You know me. We're telling the truth here. And frankly, in subsequent years, I have to say, I've never met a politician who got negative coverage who didn't think it was unfair. So uh, one thing I learned from well, Andy... What about a, a television uh, host who gets negative coverage? Well, I, I, I tell you, I, <laughs> I, get, I, get a lot of, I get a lot of notes. I get a lot of Twitter response. I get a lot of feedback. People stop me in the street. Mm -hmm. And um, what I tell people is, um, you may not like what I've said, mm -hmm. but... If it's factually wrong, I will apologize immediately. I have no ego around that. I don't try and protect incorrect information at all. Um, I also try and tell some of the officials where, you know, once in a while they'll say, look, go back and look at that. Mm -hmm. You know, you were really too hard on me. I'll go back and look at it. Mm -hmm. And I have been known to call up people and say, you know what, you're right. Mm -hmm. We were a little too tough on you. Next time around, because this is a, you know, it's a daily show, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm doing, you know, I've, I've only been there about seven months. I've done well over 100 shows at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so we have time to correct mm -hmm. anything that, that may have been out of line. Well, see, as a host of uh, Inside City Hall, uh, you are sort of the drum major. You push the questions here, you push the questions there. And I know sometimes you try to get a balance. If somebody's making a point, you give the other guests an opportunity to rebut that point. Yes. But when do you get your opinions into it? Well, I don't. I don't. And this was the biggest change. I mean, you talk about the difference between print and television. The biggest change for me is that I went from being an opinion columnist and a talk show host, where I would talk for three hours every morning about whatever was on my mind, to the anchor of the show. And as the anchor of the show, um, I'm really there to sort of manage the conversation, to introduce the segments that our reporters have done, mm -hmm. and to take uh, my guests through a conversation. And if there are two sides, I'll manage that conversation. And if there's only one person in front of me, I will take the other side just to make sure the viewers are getting all sides of the question, getting all of the relevant facts, 
and uh, hopefully enjoying themselves in the process. I notice when you take the other side, some people say that you are unfair, or that let's take the minimum wage thing in Walmart. There's some people say that, that really is destroying the wage structure of the community, and the Walmart people have to come back. So, uh, how do you get your guests? Oh, well, we, we sit around and try to figure out who we can get. Mm -hmm. And um, we do the show, frankly, pretty much the way you do, Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown. I mean, we just do, you do a half an hour once a week. We do an hour every night. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we try to stay on top of the news. We mm -hmm. try to make sure that we have whatever's going on that affects New York City and politics, whatever the, the biggest story is, we definitely want that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our set pieces, meaning we have segments that are regular Like features. the Wise Guys. We have the Wise Guys Curtis on Tuesdays. Lever. Curtis Lee were in Hurston Barrero on Wednesdays. We have Consultants on Monday, our Consultants mm -hmm. Corner, and our Friday Reporters Roundtable, which is my favorite segment because that's how I got to know the show. I used to come on a lot. And um, so that's four nights of the week. And then on Thursday, we have a sound off, which is a different kind of a format. We could do a little experimentation and play around with that a little bit. But um, other than that, we start the show with about 15, 20 minutes of hard news of whatever happened in politics in New York City that day. Uh, and then we try to bring in guests about different issues. And we also try to get behind some of the headlines. So we'll do something once in a while. We'll do something, even if it's not necessarily in the headlines, but because it's important, we think people should know about it. So there was this controversy that's going on at Medgar Evers College. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in the headlines. I don't yeah. think most of my producers had ever even heard about it. But it's of concern to me, mm -hmm. and I know it's of concern to a lot of people in the community. So we brought in the president, Dr. Pollard, to, mm -hmm. to talk, talk about what was going on. Um, and then we also do a lot of books and we do a lot of movies. Anything that has to do with politics, we, now, we'll grab it and put it right out there. Speaking of books, the new book about Malcolm by Manny Maribel. Maribel. Yes. Uh, I understand it's going to be a suit now from the person he identified as helping to orchestrate Malcolm's assassination. The fellow in New Jersey, yes. Yeah. We asked him We asked him to come on the show. Yeah, I was about to say, are you going to do that on the show? Oh, well, we, we asked him the minute his name was, met, was made known, mm -hmm. and not surprisingly, he and his attorney said, no, mm -hmm. no thanks. I imagine in a lot of controversial things, attorneys will determine whether somebody speaks up or not. Yes, yes. But, you know, this is the advantage of having a law degree. I finished, I went to night school. Uh, I went to law school at night at mm -hmm. Brooklyn Law School a few years ago. got my degree in 2005. And... Um, I'll, I, I've, I've just done this, in fact. I tell him, bring the lawyer along. Mm -hmm. he, can sit on, he can sit on camera, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I understand what they have to do and how not to trespass on people's rights or on the, the problem that they may be trying to work through a court process. So that's, that's never an issue. What we want people to do, though, is just to be part of a conversation. And, and what happens with those different segments I told you about, the wise guys talk about politics in a particular way. The consultants talk about it in a particular way. The reporters certainly... And, of course, Curtis Lee and Herson Barrero, they've got their own. It's a little humor, too. Yeah, humorous right. stuff. So, you know, this is, for me, the show is about all the different ways that New Yorkers like to talk about politics and um, teaching them to sort of hear each other a little bit better, I hope. Well, what about the social media, Twitter and Facebook? Do you get Twitter questions or Facebook questions during the show or get reaction to the show? Not during the show so much because parts of it are taped, and when I'm on the air, I, I don't have time to do anything except look in the camera and try and deliver it. But the, um, we, we're, we're making better use of it, I think. I use Twitter quite a bit. When I'm on set, I've done this a number of times, mm -hmm. and when the president's giving a speech, for example, or when the mayor's giving a speech, or when the governor's giving a speech, I'll have my computer up, mm -hmm. and I'll have the Twitter feeds running, and I'll see what people are doing, because mm -hmm. I'm following over a thousand people on Twitter now, mm -hmm. and I would say maybe a hundred or two hundred of them are reporters, mm -hmm. producers, editors, scholars, and they have a lot of insight. And they, plus a few individuals who don't have any title behind their name, but just happen to follow and, and I think have a lot of good things to say, they provide a lot of information. But that, that's about the only place I'd have to say where I really use it aggressively in a way that I couldn't get the information any other way. Well, in terms of modern politics, so much of it is dependent on 30-second bites delivered two minutes ago or yes. 45 seconds ago. Yes. To what extent has that really changed the political dialogue? Because sometimes these bites are very, very superficial, very, very harmful, and it takes a long time to clear them up. Yes. Probably the best example of clearing up is what happened to Donald Trump when he kept talking about Obama 
wasn't born in the States, and finally it forced the administration to release his birth certificate. Yes. Which yes. shows the inappropriate impact that something like the media might have on a major part of our society. Well, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because as a communicator, I would have to say it helps as much as it hurts that you can compress when people, the habit that people have of compressing complex information into just a, sl a slogan or a statement. So President Obama went pretty far just by saying, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Right, so he can't then complain <laughs> about uh, short well, soundbites. Why do you say he went far by saying yes, we can? Well, I mean, yes, we can meant a lot to a lot of people, and I mean, if you remember what it was, yeah. um, they, uh, Hillary Clinton, and this is very early in the process, yeah. said we can't have people running around, you know, uh, unrealistically raising the expectations yeah. and the hopes of the electorate. And he turned around and he said, yeah, yes, we can. And so then the young people and so on sure, voted sure, him, sure. E even though some of them might not have been happy that he was African-American. I'll, I'll give you another slogan. He, he went around saying, we're the ones that we've been waiting for. Now, anybody involved in the civil rights movement knows exactly what that's about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was something I'd heard years ago. Yeah. I mean, it was something we would say. and It, it, it was intended uh, to encourage action and to tell people, if you're sitting around waiting for Superman or the second coming of Martin Luther King, you don't have to do that. Look in the mirror. You're the, you're the savior. You're the, you're the action. You're the place where the questions are going to be resolved. And so when he said, we're the ones we've been waiting for, I just heard that. It's like, okay, I, I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. It meant something to me. A lot of other people were confused by it. Yeah. And they, they said, what, what does this mean? And, you know, and so s slogans are intended to sort of trigger... A, res a response assuming a certain kind of common history. Mm -hmm. You can evoke it with the, s the slogan. So, you know, I, I, I like slogans. I like, I like short, compact ways mm -hmm. of triggering a much larger response. But doesn't that oversimplify complex problems? For example, this whole business about education, holding mm -hmm. teachers accountable on test scores and so on. Yes. That really oversimplifies a very, very complex problem. And see, as an academic, I'm accustomed to look at those details. As a journalist, you look at them, but sometimes you, uh, journalism, compartmentalize them and, and focuses them on a narrow issue, mm. which really obscures a larger issue, which has to do with how society deals with complex problems. Well, I'll tell you that, look, this is a, this is a very basic question. I've been dealing with this my whole career. Uh, I could write as long as I wanted to when I was writing for City Limits magazine. Mm -hmm. The circulation might have been 5,000. Yeah. I can reach hundreds of thousands of people if I go on CNN. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the rub is they're only going to give me three minutes tops mm -hmm. in, in dialogue with two or three other people. So I might get in 45, 50 seconds worth of information, in which case you have to make a decision. Either I want to say everything I need to in its full complexity to almost no one, or I can try to uh, give people enough information that maybe they'll go and look and, and go deeper into it when they have a chance to. And, and it's, it's a choice, it's a, a strategic choice, frankly, that everybody has to make for, all of the time. For example, when Donald Trump was doing his birth of business, some of the uh, pundits, mainly white, said it was racist. Yes. Now, if somebody asked you that question on- I was asked Nashville, on MSNBC. What, what did you say? Multiple times. Well, first of all, I, I, <laughs> to be honest with you, I, didn't, I don't like people putting words in my mouth, you know, uh, so right. I wasn't going to let anybody, you know, sort exactly. of. Exactly. I'd interviewed Donald Trump. I'd thought about the question. I, I was in Iowa the night that Obama won. I've covered this in considerable uh -huh. detail and complexity over a number of years. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to take the whole thing and throw it away on a slogan like Donald Trump is racist. So um, what I did say, though, was that there's no evidence uh, that the president wasn't born here. Every, the, the, the vast weight of evidence nice. suggests that he was, mm -hmm. and that anybody who was peddling that birther stuff had some other agenda. Mm -hmm. And I would leave it up to the viewers. You figure out what the agenda is, or you make up your own mind. And frankly, look, something like racism is, to a certain extent, in somebody's heart. And mm -hmm. unless you think that you're able to penetrate someone's meaning. Now, I think it is fair to say that there are code words that get thrown around. Mm. And w was birtherism or the birther issue, did that end up being uh, a coded kind of a message? I think definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. And it was, uh, but, but, but frankly, I think it was more about 
the president is not legitimate. The president doesn't That's belong right. there. And, and he did belong there because he's African-American, a lot of people felt. Well, I think for, for a lot of people, they thought it was because he hadn't been in politics for a long yeah. time. For a lot of people, it was because he had used cocaine. For a lot of people, it was because but he the, wasn't a Republican. But the main thrust, I think you have to indicate, when you look at those people, they are 99.9% .9 white. And they basically are upset that there's an African-American doing that job. You know, but see, here's the thing, Dr. Brown. If you see, th th here's what made me stop short of reaching that conclusion. Mm -hmm. the, the polls were suggesting that as high as, what, 20%, I think, of registered Republicans nationwide thought the president wasn't, probably wasn't born in mm -hmm. this country. I am not willing at this point to say that there are, I mean, do you know what a large number that must be? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, right. we're talking about 20% of about, what, 48 million Republican votes were cast in 2008. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite willing to believe that there are 10 million diehard avowed racists who are not willing to die hard, host it. Well, but there's I mean, a stereotype. Many people don't think that African Americans should host the Today Show, for example. We do. We've done that now. So we, we do have that. That's the question I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. What impact has this basic change over the past 20 years in media? had on opportunities for minority journalists. What impact do you think that's had? I, I, I don't know that um, minority journalists have it very much better than they did when I first got out of mm -hmm. college. You know, the, the jobs are few and far between. Mm -hmm. And there is a mentality in the industry that suggests that only a few people of any color mm -hmm. are going to be allowed to go out and talk about the important issues of the day. So. And that's based on what? Their education, their looks, their geography? As far as I can tell, it's a little bit of all of that, as well as friendship networks. Networking is incredibly important in, in this business. And so, um, for whatever reason, I, I, well, you, know, you know what I think? I've noticed that in television in particular, there is a real bias toward your presentation and how you look. And if people yeah. just like to watch you, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you get bumped up a couple of levels. That's true. Even if you don't know anything about politics, mm -hmm. you know, even if <laughs> we you know, know that. I mean, really, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense that if you're a good communicator, then we'll take you and we can, we can fill your ear. We can talk in your ear and we can give you enough notes and preparation that you can go out and sell whatever it is the, the editorial and production staff have put together for you. But as a journalist, your education, your background has a lot to do with it. There are a good number of these hosts who are lawyers. Oh, sure. And a good number have gone to Ivy League schools. Oh, oh listen, I, I... And I hope some of them have gone to predominantly black colleges as well. Let me tell you about the class of 1984 um, at the Harvard Crimson, the school paper where I was, uh -huh. um, the class of 84, 85. Um, one member of... These are kids that I, you know, we went to yeah. school with. We wrote and did articles together. One guy um, is a member until just recently of the editorial board of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Another went to the editorial board of the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Another was the front page editor of the Wall Street Journal. And right behind us in the class of 85 is a kid who used to write sports, Jeff Zucker, who became the president of NBC. Mm -hmm. The head of the um, newspaper group for the Hearst uh, publishing empire was in my class. Mm -hmm. I mean... And this, this is just a handful of people where That's we would have true. dinner together every night but as what, teenagers. What about the network of black colleges? Have they produced uh, minority journalists who really move ahead, or is it mainly the predominantly white colleges? No, that's, a good, that that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so, to tell you the truth. My, my sense is that the kids who are going through Howard and Morehouse and the, the, the big black schools are becoming owners. They're not sitting in front and, of cameras. Many of them going to print journalism, like Essence and uh, Black Enterprise and so on. But what about BET? Mm. Yeah, that's a black television network. Sure. I would assume that, well, didn't Tom Joyner go to a black college? I, 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 I believe so. Don't I know. believe so. I don't know. I mean, but, you know, the former president of BET, Reggie Hudlin, yeah, that's true. was a buddy of mine, lived in my dorm. Let me ask the, the question to come to the end. What was the most challenging interview you've ever done? Oh, boy. I think the, the hardest interviews I've done were um, when I was in the print world, sitting in a kitchen or in a living room talking to someone whose son had just been killed. I believe that. That is, that is very, very tough stuff. There was a police, it was a, a police killing out in, uh, in Bed-Stuy. And 
I mean, what do you, you know, what do you say? What, what do you, do you ask? Say? And while you're trying to find out what went on, because you've got this exclusive interview, this ended up in a front page story for me. You've also got to talk to them. You know, you've got to do some of the basic work of journalism. You've got to make sure you spell their name right. What year were they born? What are the mm -hmm. siblings' names? How do you spell the siblings' names? And it's, it's very tough to pull that off and keep your own emotions in check and get the story and get it quickly and get it right. So these, th that to me has always been the hardest part. But at least in print journalism, they don't see your face when you do it. No, well, that's true. That's true. In fact, they don't care how you do it. You just got to get it right mm -hmm. and get it quick. And um, the, the, I teach at the CUNY Journalism School. And um, what I've always told the students is, you can master the numbers and all the statistics, and I can give them the tools. We can teach them that in the classroom. It's when you're out in the field and you're trying, again, to control yourself, you know, your own emotions, and remember the basics of your job, getting the information, getting it quickly and accurately, and then presenting it quickly, because <laughs> the logistics of all of this stuff is something nobody ever talks about. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere and you got no signal, and you've got to produce a story on very, very, very short notice. Um, that, that's when you separate the pros mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the amateurs. It's, it's like medicine. You, when you're in the operating room, uh, you're concerned with the life of the patient, but you also have to do what your skills allow you to do exactly and right. that you've learned in the past. Exactly right. Exactly right. I mean, look, one of the, one of the hardest stories I ever had to write was um, when uh, James Davis was assassinated at City Hall mm -hmm. back in 2003. Was. He was a friend of mine. I rode to the hospital with his mother. Mm -hmm. I was there with her when the doctor uh, gave her the bad news. And after all of that was over and everybody finished crying, I had to call my newsroom. And, you know, they gave me a deadline, and I had to turn it around very quickly and write something. And it was very tough. Uh, today on African American Legends, we've been talking with Earl Lewis, uh, the host of uh, Inside City Hall on New York One television. And we're learning some of the intricacies of the journalism industry. Thanks, Errol, for being with us today and sharing that information. Thank you. Thank you very much.